Welcome. It's just gone 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Thursday the 14th of March, and you are watching Regional Wrap, episode 124. Regional Wrap, providing an insight on the issues affecting regional Australia and giving a voice to regional residents. My name is Bill Bates, and joining me on this episode is the government land gifting betraying our future. Um, my guests, Anna Power and Michael Offendale. Anna is a mother, teacher, farmer and cotton gin owner who is wanting the best for all Australians. She is a former committee member of the WinCot, Women in Cotton, and a volunteer, a volunteer organisation developed to help and foster networking opportunities and learning for women involved in the many areas of the Australian cotton industry and rural communities. Anna remains an active member and mentor. Although dismissed from a teaching position for non-compliance with the COVID vaccination mandates, Anna continues to volunteer at the Gundawindi High School Tuck Shop and is the secretary of the Gundawindi <coughs> Meals on Wheels. Michael is the proprietor of the Tubia Hotel, one of our premier country pubs established in 1911 and purchased by the Offendale family in 1998. The, hell, the hotel is well regarded throughout the region of southern Queensland. Welcome, Anna and Michael. Howdy. Have I had the, welcome. Uh, I'd just like to start off with you, Michael, because um, it was the uh, newspaper article uh, that attracted my attention, which had your uh, uh, picture on it um, and the conversation. Uh, this, this this reserve, your your hotel backs onto it. Uh, can you give us a bit of a history of, of the reserve and what's happening and when this process started? Uh, yeah, definitely. It's actually not just a reserve. This is where people have got it wrong. It actually includes uh, other <coughs> in the town, which is our uh, town common, our like the two beer dump as well. Also our town hall reserve and it's it's also part of our rodeo ground. So they're sort of just trying to, you know, make it sound something smaller than it is. It actually is ninety five percent of our town. So it probably started, I don't know, five or six years ago. We don't really know anything other than when those minutes come out on the twenty fourth of January. So that was sort of when the general public, you know, fully became aware of what was going on. So from that uh, period back. Yeah, it's all a bit of a mystery, but it did appear there was two applications. One of them originally was for some area surrounding the um, kindergarten, which was the uh, the whole reserve paddock, and uh, I'm not sure if it included some other parts of the, the town. And then uh, something fell over with that, and we got to this other one where the uh, state government, the Gundawini Regional Council, and the Big Mall Aboriginal Corporation uh, agreed to give up 95% of our town. The, um, the Aboriginal group, uh, I just noticed that it's uh, the native title office or, or that associated with the group is actually somewhere located in north of Brisbane. Uh, so how is this all connected in regards to the original people who are, who are there and, and the people who are actually engaging in the conversation? Well, essentially, like historically... Um... Obviously, the Big and Bull people and other uh, First Nations tribes or Aboriginal tribes, uh, like however you want to describe it, they were like migratory people that wandered through the land and like utilised the uh, conditions as they were presented to them. So, the to be a reserve as such, as far as the Big and Bull people or any other um, Aboriginal people throughout history goes, is that they didn't get there till we forced them into the reserve, essentially like Australia. As uh, some of the bigger farms back in the day broke up, like Welltown Station, for example, it was broken up into a lot of smaller places and that forced a lot of um, you know, uh, First Nations people uh, into Tubir and also into uh, Bungunya as, you know, people sort of took over the land and, and started with that. So historically, though, our reserve didn't have really permanent water until we actually weird the uh, Weir River, which puts water into the Yarrawana Creek to keep the township of Tubir in Bungunya with a decent water supply. So, like, essentially, uh, 
the direct history of people living in the reserves probably from around 1905 to around 1968 when the two-beer school uh, closed. And so everybody that was here at that point uh, was moved to Sherberg either forcibly or willingly. I don't, I don't have much information in that. But that's why um, you basically find the Big and Bull Corporation sort of based in that Brisbane, the Gold Coasty area and you know, obviously into Sherberg. Uh, Anna, you provided me with a 16-page uh, submission that you put in in regards to this matter. Uh, how you're located a bit a bit further away from the, this area than uh, Michael is, how did you become interested or involved in the situation? Um, well, we have a farm out between Torwood and Mugendai where we used to live. Um, we also have a farm where I live east of Gundawindi. It's all in the Gundawindi region. We all pay rates here. We all pay state government taxes. This is state-based claim and the council are heavily involved. So my um, humble opinion, any person should go and be interested in this. Um, so when we heard about it, um, Glenn, my partner, Xavier, my oldest, we all went to the uh, meeting, the hastily held meeting, and um, it was just a shit show. Like, they stood there really not knowing what they were talking about, and I did have some idea because I was a... Um, I campaigned very hard for the no vote in the voice because it, this Indigenous industry, I prefer to say Aboriginal industry because Aboriginal was the original word we used and then it went to Indigenous and now it's First Nations, which was appropriated from Canadian activists and then co-opted by the United Nations and now is being used to justify treaties because without two nations, you can't do a treaty. So if you follow the way all the way back, it goes back to the UN and then back to Canada. Um, so there were never any nations here, as Michael said. Uh, it was a population, it's a very small population of hunter-gatherers, which is what we learned in history when we went to school. History is now being rewritten to make out that there were farmers and engineers, which I find very patronising and racist because what's wrong with being a hunter and gatherer? Nothing. Who cares about the hunters and gatherers? They got around this country the best they could. The, the other thing is, this has been in the background for obviously a number of years because uh, the council's been involved and they've obviously been in discussions with the state government and that. Um, what, what, <coughs> sorry, why has it taken to, so long to sort of get to this, this stage? I could probably uh, help you out with that there. So I sort of worked out something was wrong when I tried to buy some uh, USL land next to some other land that we've got already. And I knew we could buy it because we'd had approval in the past in the drought, but we just didn't have the money to, to be able to do it. It's literally 3,000 square metres, so it's nothing too drastic. So the Department of Resources basically said, oh, don't put your application in because it won't get approved. And I was like, well, that's a bit odd. So do you mind if I ask why? And uh, they said, well, we can't tell you. And I was like, well, that's, that's a bit strange. So obviously, like, from that point forward, we knew there was a little something going on, but, like, obviously we don't know what that is. I'm just a publican. I don't, don't really follow that. Essentially, though, so when we got to the, further towards this uh, application being agreed to by the council, I was sort of in talks with some of the town councillors and basically just... I was getting a hint from them that it probably wasn't going to necessarily go that good for the town. I didn't obviously realise it could do what they're doing now. It's completely insane. But, um, yeah, essentially I talked to a lady at the Department of Resources and uh, she, you know, I had to sort of get her in my position. I said, if it was you and you'd lived here and you were going to get you know, locked out of everything that you and the generations before you had ever enjoyed, like, would you be happy about that? And she said, well, yeah, no, I wouldn't. And I said, well, you know, if if you were me, what, what would you have to do to make this go away? And she basically said um, the council needs to pull the current application because we consider that application a community consultation. So essentially the council itself, though, said 
uh, its reasoning was is, is look, you know, we've asked for community consultation from the state government. However, we know the Gunnawee Regional Council that that consultation is not guaranteed. And we're doing this deal because at any time the state government could do a deal without talking to us at all. And this is the best deal we could get. So essentially this lady at the resources department, you know, after a fair bit of talking and put a lot of work into it, she um, <laughs> she basically said the Gundawindi Regional Council doesn't understand the process and she said we consider this the community consultant. So I was like, right, could you put that in writing for me? She said, not a chance. I was like, oh, <laughs> okay, that's a... <laughs> That's helpful. I appreciate that. So anyway, um, obviously, I sort of got a bit of a sniff that we might have been onto something a bit dodgy. So yeah, we just pursued it through and we started to push a bit hard. I've got a few other locals and they involved and we forced them to actually have a meeting. And they basically, the, all the councillors and the mayor came to our kindergarten and then tried to tell probably 150 landholders and people that live out here that they should enjoy this application, like just lose the town and be happy with it. And so obviously <laughs> it was bizarre that they even came to try and do that. It just made absolutely no sense at all because no one's ever going to cop that. It's just insanity. Why they need all of that land as freehold to start with is crazy. They can do any kind of tourism uh, ventures that they like out there now as it is. And we've actually worked, we've tried to work with them in the past to to do some tourism stuff because we wanted to tell like the history of our whole area, like, but not both sides. It's not really both sides is the right word, just our history, like everyone that's lived here and been here. And that was just something that was sort of passionate to us. We started a progress group back in 2017. We were trying to work towards bits and pieces like that. And um, yeah, so basically we had no community, no consultation from the council at all, really, with what was going on, or the state government, and they did it all behind closed doors and then dumped it on the table there, I don't know, probably two weeks or three weeks or something before the election, just hoped it would get buried and be forgotten about. Um, the only thing they sort of did wrong with it was they thought the only person in Tubi was me. It was insane because there's so many people out here. There's so much money invested in this western area that, everyone cares about this and it's not a good thing for our community to to do stuff like this it's crazy is, is this the first experimental run for uh yeah. you'll own nothing and be happy mm. it yeah. seems to be like that but but why why do you think the you know the, the might anna might have a bit of eye. why do you think governments like, uh, or local councils and state governments are sort of you know, trying their hardest to gift as much away of our property and, and public property uh, to the Indigenous and that. And, well, and they, seem, they, they seem to be doing it. Though. So they're, like you say, behind closed doors, they're coming up with all these schemes and just lo unloading on the, on, on the public all the time. Is, is it's obviously something not, that's not generated by the people, uh, and that's what you know. We we want things to change on the basis of what people want, not things change on the way on the basis of what people in Brisbane in a in a concrete building uh, thinks good for us. Uh, do you want me to talk? Yep. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, I call it social, socialism by stealth. The fact of the matter is that native title and all these acts are racist and patronising. Indigenous or Aboriginal people uh, basically never really get anywhere with native title or these acts. So this particular act, the Aboriginal Land Act of 1991, which is Queensland based, every state has its own Aboriginal Land Act and Cultural Heritage Act, plus we have native title overlaying federally. And so with this Aboriginal Land Act, the title gets transferred into the Big and Bull Corporation, which you really need to look into these corporations because they are dodgy as fuck. Like it is a very strange setup. And it basically is a gravy train for a few people. And the lawyers are getting very rich out of it. There are like 52 native title lawyers alone based in Brisbane. 
So follow the money, always follow the money, as we know. Um, so this, this, if they get the title transferred, then they have to go to start part two of the Act, which means then that's when the community consultation is supposed to kick in. So basically they bypassed the first part of the Act, which is the big and bull corporation putting an expression of interest to the state, the state taking it to the council, the council deciding, and really they say it should be all top secret, but really the, t the community should be consulted. They're the ones that live there. They're the ones that pay rates and pay taxes. They're connected to the land. No current big and bull ancestors live in that area. So after that happens, the council gives a nod to the state minister and the state minister has the final decision to actually transfer the title, which the council are currently trustee of, to the Big and Bull Corporation. Then, and only then, that corporation say we would like to put in a claim under the Aboriginal Land Act. And if the minister, who's the only one, can sign off on that, has done the proper consultation, which involves an ad in the local paper and consultation with the um, local people, proper consultation, not bullshit that we've had, and then the minister, it's all up to the minister, so no politics there. So the minister can then give them the tick and the land is, um, the title goes into the Bigable Corporation. From there, they can lease it, they can use it commercially and they can lock the gate. So we get, keep getting told, oh, we won't lock the gate, we won't lock the gate. What's happened at Mark Warning? They locked the gate. I think that might be a um, native title so complicated, it is ridiculous. But anyway, I think that's native title, but still they lock the game. So for us to sit there and they're going, I'll just trust Justin Saunders, just trust him, he lives at the Gold Coast and has no connection with the land, but comes out and tells us that we have to have cultural activities run by him, which he can do. He can buy his own land, he can build his cultural centre and he can run cultural activities into the native title. They can camp there, they can fish, they can do cultural activities, they can use scar trees as markers. Like, it doesn't have to cost anything, but everything in this industry costs the taxpayers a fucking fortune. And it is out yeah. of control. The, the other, other, other thing is, uh, let's just go back to Michael. Um, can you give us a bit of an idea in regards to the land that's under question? What what it's being used for now, and and how many people are actually involved and benefit from it in its current state, and then what do you think will happen uh, if this goes ahead in regards to who can have use or and how many people will sort of be cut out of the equation? Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, the whole of Queensland can use it now, Australia, essentially, for the last 115 years, like camping and fishing. It's it's designated purposes for uh, travelling stock to, like, uh, water them, you know, hold them there for a night or two and away you go kind of thing. Uh, essentially, for us, though, it's more than just the reserve because it also is the uh, town common. So, where yeah, historically, people have put horses and stuff in there or, you know, it's a place where people can go and wander about and do stuff. Uh, it's part. It's our hall reserve as well. So where our town hall used to be, and you know, obviously one day we hope to get that back there again. It's uh, half of our rodeo ground, rodeo camp draft ground. So if we want to hold a rodeo and camp draft in the future, we don't have anywhere to hold stock because they're giving it all away to a company based in Brisbane. And it's also our dump. So our old town dump site, uh, which you know it was a perfect spot for the town sewerage to probably go one day just would benefit everyone in the in the town that's currently here now um yeah as far as though its uses is yeah it's it's just used by everybody anyone can go there and do that kind of thing so if we want to encourage staff and growth in the area and people to want to live here and we go and lock up the only thing you can do it just makes it a really unhospitable place and it's going to make it tougher for everybody what about access between places? Like, I mean, you obviously got your hotel there, and there's three whole land, and there's other other occupants in there. Uh, will there be any difficulty in uh, transiting different areas of that within the township or in and out of the township? 
Oh, potentially, yeah. It's uh, got all of our water infra- water uh, infrastructure for the towns actually in it. So they're trying to negotiate around that and uh, do different bits and pieces of that. But like as far as actually being able to have enough land for the current town to one day be like every other town with sewerage, potable water, stormwater, et cetera, well, it will never happen because we won't have any land left to do it because we've literally given it all away to Aboriginal freehold. Um, um, can I just say something because I missed Aboriginal freehold cannot ever be sold. So they're so it's a form of communism, I think, because they get given given this land, but then it stays in trust of the corporation forever. They can never sell it. And yeah, they so also actually, can't really actually... make much use of it either. They can't really. Well, no, they can. They can. There's, there's good. There's, as Michael says, there's power. There's water. There's some flat areas that could be built on. They, they, they can definitely be used, but they can never sell it. So they, so they're always beholden to the government. And with, this is a whole setup. They're, at the, they're slaves of the government because our, our, um... indigenous people can never, um, indigenous can never actually own this land that's so they're so connected to sorry i'm very pissed off oh you're right our local councillors though and our mayor uh obviously all came out got around the shire everyone that called them and just tried to assure them that there wasn't going to be like a a mission or something built here like as if you know don't worry there's not going to be a whole lot of aboriginal people moved to your town we were not that's not what our concern essentially was at all obviously they've got some kind of um past racial hang-ups of their own there. I'm not sure what it is, but we just wanted literally <laughs> to control the future of our town, like uh, actually have a say in it for all of us. We, we don't care who lives here, but we want to actually have it done properly and we want our town to be um, to be good going forward. And it's got to service the, the current industry that's here. Look, we're one of the big, sort of the best places to grow cotton in Australia. We've got some of the big sort of farming families around the area. Uh, dry land crops are massive. We're a chance at one day hopefully having um, small crops again. We've got the railhead here, uh, plenty of power. We've got a bore. Like it's it's a really good spot. And, yeah, it just seems crazy to give the whole entire future of our town to a corporation based out of Brisbane. And that's probably that doesn't really have any idea how to make it go forward anyway or very little interest to it unless it's well, just simply yeah. for, for rent. Well, their only way to make a profit out of it is to uh, lease lease the land essentially. So whether they lease that back to the government for social housing, which is something they've indicated they're going to do in our shire. Uh, the mayor assured us, though, we don't have to worry about that in Tubi, but they're going to do it near Love and um, Gundawindi, Texas and Inglewood. Uh, so the social housing, though, essentially isn't a mission. Like, you're not trying to scare people in that fashion. Social housing is uh, essentially commission housing from back in the day. Like, you can't afford a house, go in there and they'll bloody find you one. Do you want to move to Tubi? No worries, mate. Like, that's, that's what it is. But we're just sort of saying if we ever did have housing here, it really does need to sort of work for what's already here and what we're short on, which is, like, servicing agriculture. And it also has to have appropriate in- infrastructure, like you say, sort of water and, and yeah. sewage for, for it, just for a start. Um, yeah. But but the other thing is, why is it, this is this case is slightly different from most of the um, native title claims and the other bits and pieces that go on. Um, and maybe you can give us a bit of an idea because. In 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 that history, that sixteen pages of submission you had, there was obviously you brought out a lot of things that obviously the state government didn't really research that well, or even the council had a, had a reasonable idea of what what had happened before. Um, can you give us a bit of an idea in regards to uh, your submission and what the message you were trying to get through to the the powers of the, to be? Yeah. Well, we're basically saying that they haven't followed the process from the very beginning, so they need to take it back to the very beginning. It needs to be followed properly as according to the Act, which is, you know, clear as day. I don't think any of them have read it and they don't seem to want to read it because after we sent in that submission, 
um, which outlined it exactly. Uh, Michael Offerdale's sister is a very talented property lawyer and she gave us a hand because they were just um, ignoring us because I don't know what, no respect, I'm not sure. So she gave us a hand just to put it together nicely. So then submitted it again like that. Still, the mayor got up and at the meet the candidates and said the same spiel, like he'd never even read this email. The same spiel over and over and over again. He keeps conflating native title with the Aboriginal Land Act. So I don't know whether he doesn't know the difference between the two, even though I was pointing out the submission. And so everyone's confused and then they hear freehold. So they think they're their land's going to get stolen, which isn't true. This all this is all revolves around state and crown land, but still, state and crown land is owned by us. It's not owned by the government. We pay the government to look after that land for us. Mm. <laughs> Yet they seem to be just wheeling and dealing behind closed doors with the people not in mind at all. I mean, I go down the street, I sit in the street, I talk to people. I can't. No one says to me, "Oh." The mayor was down asking me what he, you know, what I want for my town. It's all coming out of somewhere else. Mm. That, that's a strange that, situation in regards to usually the council, because I, I mean I'm not a lover of local government because there's no such thing. They're just local councils and a state arm, arm of the state government. Well, they right. weren't when they were volunteers. They weren't when they were volunteers. A good friend of mine, a smart friend of mine pointed out that when they started getting paid, they became a branch of the state. Before that, they were volunteers and it wasn't political, whereas now Lawrence Springborg is the current president of the LNP. Is that a conflict of interest, being well, the mayor and the president of the LNP? And I wrote to Christopher Foley and said... Well, this is a conflict of interest, and oh, no, no reply as usual. No reply to a taxpayer. Normally, like, in this oh. situation, uh, Bill, we'd be able to go to one side of politics, and they'd, you know, listen to our story and potentially help us. Considering <laughs> yeah. that both sides of politics <laughs> in uh, Queensland said before the Voice that they supported uh, the treaty, which this is basically the treaty process. It took 70% of Queensland to vote no in the voice referendum to tell them they were wrong. It wasn't even 70% of LNP voters, literally 70% of Queensland to tell them they were wrong. They've, you know, since then come and said, oh, we're not going to support this anyway. Anastasia said, well, I'm going to jam it through, so don't worry about that. We're sitting here with our mayor being the LNP president of Queensland and our mayor, and he wants this to happen. We can't get the support from the LNP in Queensland. They've basically told us, oh, yeah, there's nothing going to happen here. You know, just cop it on the chin and I move know, on with your told, life. I got told by our state member that I don't have to show you anything. <laughs> well, mm. well, that's one thing oh, it was it's surprising. Uh, they're, they're both in, in the same, same camp in, in this matter because uh, I'm up in Cairns and they, they held the parliament up here back in May last year, and uh, Anna sort of came up with the uh, pushing the treaty sort of thing and that she just allocated 300 odd million dollars to the pathway to treaty. And in, this, in that in that session, Chris Fawley got up and backed them, backed them 100 percent. And I, I understand that there was just such a, you know, a wave of people you know, with angst uh, you know the old old nationals and even a lot of the liberals were you know taken back by this captain's call. Um, but you're right. The, the oh, heaven help us if if the voice had it got up. Um, at least this sort of you know slowed the process down. But obviously the bureaucracy behind the whole system is still churning over and trying to make this process happen, whether we like it or not. And it's, yeah, happening, it's happening federally as well. I was told that um, in the Senate they're just pushing the voice, uh, all the voice stuff through the Senate as quickly as they can. The couple of people who are questioning it are not allowed to debate it. They're getting it two or three hours and then the bell rings and the vote's done because Lambie and Pocock are siding with the Greens and um, Labor. So it's a done deal. So they're madly pushing all this legislation, digital ID, um, the voice stuff, what's the other stuff? 
getting tired. Anyway, they're just ramming it through the centre at the moment. Hmm. Historically, Bill, we would have been able to uh, get the National Party to stand up for us in Queensland, but um, you wouldn't believe it. The same party. bloke involved in all of this is the one that can win the LNP together. Like, yeah. it's insane. You couldn't write this story if you tried. Well, well that's that's the thing that I can't get over. Why, why are these people, you know, so eager to sort of win some sort of brownie points and just... You know, wave right, this red rag at, at normal people who just want to get on with their life and and make progress and build wealth for everyone in the nation. They seem to be hell bent on sort of well, anything we can throw at you to stop you, we'll, we'll do it. They weren't hugged enough as kids. It was probably where <laughs> it is by their parents. Like I just don't think they had any love then, and perhaps now they're <laughs> trying to make themselves feel better by doing this strange social stuff that the majority plus of the country just told them was stupid. Like, it's crazy. <laughs> One okay. of the other, it, is, it is the council elections at the moment. Has there been any sort of blowback in regards to this issue? In the no, general? no, the, the, the media's scared of it, as if it's like some kind of great big thing. We've got a Courier-Mail article there. It's got the most comments and likes and interaction of anything the courier mail's put out this year but it's massive and people just don't want to touch it because they're scared of the state lnp it's it's like a protection oh. racket for people that are incompetent it's crazy yeah i have to say one thing um sarah murphy at the argus which is now part owned by daniel morgan from i think star media so they've been buying up regional papers around and i've I feel like I've got a little bit of hope again in journalism because I've um, encouraged Sarah, who's very actually very good journalist and very impartial. She's not she's not being bullied by either side. She's sticking to her line and being an impartial journalist, which is like where do you find them these days? Yeah. And to be fair, the Courier Mail was really good, good, good with us. Like they've they've done a great uh, Riley, bit to Riley help us. The there. Courier Mail is stressed out of her brain because she's. Editing two papers and writing articles. I mean, they've just, they've, Murdoch is just, not just Murdoch, a whole lot of them have just gutted journalism. So they can't do proper journalism and they can't do proper journalism because they're all, all the media outlets are bought and paid for. Mm. So basically, if you go back to the crust of it all, is, is our six councils and our mayor agreed that this is the best deal they could do. They supported the application, sent the application forward. They sent that there knowing that we had no guarantee of community consultation and they also knew by then that the state government couldn't just do whatever they wanted because we'd given the legal advice which indicated they were wrong. Uh, the state government could right now stop this happening because it is part of a township. It is 95% of our township too. It's not just a little bit. And our... Um, <laughs> and our uh, local council could also remain as the trustee of the... Uh, to be reserved in all these other areas and stop it happening as well. So they want it to happen. I don't know why they want it to happen. And, you know, that's not on me to find out. But hopefully a, a good journalist one day might look into that. The other thing that's um very strange, considering how big this is for our community, our shire, is that uh, no one seems to want to ask these councils individual questions about it. Like, you know, you might have supported it. Do you still support it knowing what's happening now? Well, Michael, they won't say anything. Michael, they can't because they've been gagged. We know that. We know they're not allowed to talk. That's a dictatorship. We live in a democracy. You know that. You can do whatever you the, want. Just do it. Yeah, but they're choosing to be gagged. So at the hmm. first meeting at Tabea, Michael asked one of the councillors directly, what do you think of this? And he said, Lawrence speaks for us. That's a dictatorship. That's not a democracy. Yeah, yeah it's everyone not should have, have an opinion and they should voice it in, in the yeah. council. And I'm sure there's a lot of people that were on that council there that if they could have, they wouldn't have had this happen. So however the situation has been presented to some of them, yeah, it's it's obviously not been presented in a truthful fashion to them all. Maybe some of them probably regret it now and, you know, they'd love to come and have a beer with us. But anyway, none of them are. <laughs> They're all still there. <laughs> But, um, but, it, but it's the uh, problem. It's the problem. It's, it's the councils and the councillors are no longer the force they used to be. It's the CEOs and these executives that put in there that are making 
all this sort of stuff happen and providing the advice, advice that furthers the narrative rather than the community because uh, we've got the same situation up here in um, Cairns uh, just before the elections, uh, probably about two or three months ago, uh, the executive told them they had to make this decision on our water supply and commit to uh, $225 million for the first stage and another $200 uh, to $300 million on the second stage to provide water for cans for the next 15 years. Now, it got to the situation that the, can, uh, the councillors were, they were resisting, you know, because there's got to be a new council elected in a couple of months saying, well, this thing should be held over for the new council to debate properly and, and take in more information. But basically, the executive railroaded or forced them into this, making the decision because the contracts had to be written up now uh, to uh, guarantee this original, this initial money supply. So can that can that be in part of the problem is, and that the the councillors aren't really in control as much as some people might think and it's and the executive is making these sort of you know um, inquiries or agreements with with the state government or being directed by the state government it's concerning as a councillor that you'd be incompetent enough to get yourself in that position perhaps you shouldn't have put your hand up at the start if you can't just understand the basics of like humanity where we've come from and where we're going like it, it's oh, just Matt, Matt, Michael, crazy Michael Miss Powers might have to differ a little bit <laughs> I think these councillors it's a part-time job albeit it's paid now but most of them have got other jobs that they're trying to do um for example, this Aboriginal Land Act, the legislation is ridiculously complicated for someone to get their head around it. They have had time, I have to say. I'm not, I'm not bailing them out totally, but I do think there is a dependency of councillors on the um, bureaucracy because things are so complicated now that it takes a lot of time to get across it. So it's easier to, to defer to the so-called experts in the bureaucracy who it's their full-time job to do it. Yeah, but those those full-time those executives and those experts, you know, they they a lot of them run on an agenda you know, because they're all a big. You know, people in those executives are big clubs of people. You know, they go from one council to the other and they gradually step up from a. You know, two hundred and fifty thousand dollar job with a smaller council, then move up, and their lot, and their probably life goal is to move up and be the uh, CEO of um, Brisbane and get you know five or six hundred thousand dollars a year, plus plenty of travel at the front end of the plane and 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 a and a, and a good uh, expense account. And that's um, exactly the same as the Aboriginal corporations. That's how yeah. they run. They're a profit based have... driven entity. I have to say, pre um, this current council, I have never had bad vibes. I mean, it wasn't amazing, but we, we, we're a town that's quite stable, so the council members, the council workers have been there for a long time. Maybe that's a problem as well in a different way. Um, our, ex, our last mayor was a good guy, um, and generally things plodded along quite nicely. Everything changed when... Um, our new mayor came along, everything has changed. We seem to now be getting a lot of direction from Brisbane. The state seems to be very uh, enmeshed with us. There's lots of money going around and we all know that once you take the grant, you get the contracts, then you're, you have to answer to someone. You're not your own person anymore. And this is the whole of Australia now. We have big government, we have government contracts, and we have government grants. And people will not speak out because they're beholden to the government. Michael and I are beholden to no one. So we don't give a flying fuck. I'm pretty scared. But we're of you, the though. minority now. We're the minority. There's all you know, a lot of Australians are beholden to government money and they will not speak out. I think that's an issue all over the place. I mean, I've contacted a number of people to do uh, interviews on this show after I've seen seen a story in the newspaper. And a lot of people seem to be fine with 
uh, a 10 second grab on TV or radio or a few lines in print. But when you try to get them all come and do an interview and tell us the whole story, uh, gee whiz, they backpedal like some of them backpedal like anything. But just going back to one of your things, Michael, in regards to the council didn't know really what it was doing because it didn't have the expertise. But the thing is, if if they had to put this out in the public arena a lot earlier for discussion within the community... Um, oh, it's a different election, mate. A, 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 a lot of information and opinion and expert opinion can come in and get used hmm. because I'm afraid six councillors and the CEO and CFEO of a council are not the font of all knowledge. The, 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 the community combined has probably got more sense and knowledge and especially knowledge of the history of the area to provide great input to you know, probably stop this thing before it even got got off the ground. Yeah, it's like, actually crazy. We uh, tried to apply for a, a part of this called Lot 10. We we're just trying to get somewhere we could put the town sewerage essentially, but we were going to try and go our own way with it and then hopefully get the... Uh, shy to come on board and utilize the infrastructure we put through so we applied for for lot 10 which is a contentious part of this on the railhead and basically got a letter back from resources which said yeah there's no native title issues here as such like it's not involved in a current application or anything like that if, if you want to try and do this in a lease or a freehold fashion get onto the gundawindi regional council and uh get them to push it forward so we did that and then we got a response back from the gundawindi regional council saying that well, there's no access there at the moment, like due to the um, railway line being there. So we you couldn't do it. And then it's obviously seems a bit strange that now that's not an issue, that that access thing is. And as, as far as I'm sort of aware, I don't think the big Aboriginal Corporation has a fleet of helicopters or something that's going to fly in and out of that paddock with. It's just, it's just the whole thing's just to suit a few, a few, a few little people there. It's crazy, yeah. Well, I'll just come back to you, Lena, in regards to, uh, you're talking about the, the former council was probably reasonably, reasonably good and sort of um, on the side of the side of the community and now now you've got this shift. Um, I, I think you're talking about Lawrence Springboard, the former, I think he was the leader of that LMP at one stage. That, that's a big, pretty big come down from being in state parliament to come become a mayor. Uh, do you think some of this is tied to sort of delusions of grandeur and and sort of um, getting brownie points for the for the greater system of the LNP or or state government? No, I don't. Um, I think there is a quite a large agenda. That's probably too much for this show tonight. We now have a a Singapore based. Uh, solar farm that no one knew about going in just out of Gundawindi, which has, is so um, this company, um, Metis, is building a 13-kilometre ditchman road on a road that about four families use with their farms. So suddenly they're clearing trees of, you know, when us farmers, God, if we knock a tree over the fucking satellite, takes a photo and then we've got the government on our back. They're just, well, I've got pictures of it. I put it on Facebook today. Um, clearing old trees, they want to clear a causeway to build a road for this Singapore-based um, renewables company. It's very strange and no one in town knew about it because the consultation process at the moment, which really needs to change, is that they have to put a sign up on a fence or a gate, which... This road no one uses except for a couple of people. So if they can put a little sign up, that's their consultation, and they can put it, and they have to put that in the paper. You can put an ad in the paper anywhere in Australia. So if you, they could put the ad, the consultation ad, over in Perth. This is how bad it is. This is a very big, bad situation for Australia. They have put on a public road that they're doing up to this solar farm, they have a sign saying that you can't enter this, keep going along this road without calling the manager. This is a public road. <laughs> this, this is really spooky stuff. I, I think uh, what you're both alluding to is that there seems to be a concerted effort against ordinary people 
um, getting the best out of their own property and their own community and their own assets. Um, That's why and everyone needs to join One Nation. One Nation is the only political party in this country that is not beholden to corporate money or union money. It's the only party. It's a little bit of a shit show. Sorry, Pauline. <laughs> Pauline and Malcolm Roberts are the only 100% honest politicians in Canberra today. We brought yeah. her up last week. Was it last week, Michael? Yeah, we Wednesday. And you, did, I, I, you did have Pauline come down there too. Um, did, we gave her the a, information. That, that was a couple of meetings. Was we gave her the information on this and four days later, like within four days of this happening, she'd issued a statement asking for due process and putting a hold on it. So then she obviously um, said she'd like to come up and see us and I thought, well, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, that'd be awesome. She, she, came also, up. Yeah. she also wrote a letter to um, Springborg and a letter to uh, Scott Stewart saying that they were going to Minister for land stealing. <laughs> Industry <and> land stealing. <laughs> so she, she wrote a letter to both of them. Neither of them replied formally, but um, one of them was on the phone to her saying, that's not right, that's not true, they're not telling the truth, but never responded in writing. Mm, they were getting around saying, like, we were conspiracy theorists at the start. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. We're not the ones taking 95% of someone's town, <laughs> crazy bastards, but... Uh, well, wait, 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 wait till the... Um, the uh, Misinformation bill goes past. You know, misinformation. The government are exempt from their own misinformation, but Michael and I aren't. Yeah, well, well that, it know, does you know, pose a problem for people like me. Yeah, we'll be all in the gulags because we'll be accused of mis and disinformation. And that's what James Lister accused us of in on Facebook. And then in the Argus, it was put in that we were spreaders of misinformation. Yeah, it was pretty good. James James Lister didn't want to say anything, but we helped make him say something. And then he had a bit of an online argument with a few people on the uh, Facebook post. Oh, man, it was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, we tried to help him. We told him what was going on at the start. And we asked for his support. And he told us, he actually said, probably one of the most powerful statements I've ever heard in my life. And I'll probably never use it, though. I don't think I'll ever be quite the man to uh, deliver something as, as powerful as what he did. But he basically said, um, Michael, I only fight fights I can win, and I can't win this one. So I was like, uh, you're in a bit of trouble here. <laughs> well, we've got to fold. We've got to fold all the time. Yes. So <laughs> well, Mr. David Little Prowse actually put out a... Uh, an email which supports us and said basically what we want him to do. We, um, yeah, but he hasn't put anything actually out formally in the media as well. It's uh, obviously he's a federal nationals and, you know, he, he 100% agrees with us. He's on our side. But no, he's, he's not. He's dreaming, Michael. He's he would be to a degree. He's They're not as crazy zero. as the Queensland guys. The Queensland guys are into some weird he stuff. Said, he sold us out to net zero. He is not on our side. <laughs> Yeah, well, a lot of people I, love I suppose I suppose the problem really is that there is no real national party. I mean, uh, people like Canavan and Little Proud can call themselves national, but the whole fact is they're welded to the LMP Brisbane office, and that's the end of mm. it. There's no independence. Uh, the New South Wales New, uh, National Party is supposedly independence, but gee whiz, I mean, from the days of Barilaro and before, they're actually welded at the hips. I mean, I mean, fan fancy a, a national party uh, going against, um, uh, what are they, dish liquors um, owners and, and, and council amalgamations. I mean, gee whiz, mm. you don't have to, you know, give you, put, a, put a bullet in your own head. And that mm. cost them about three seats in uh, New South Wales that eventually went to the Shooters Party firstly, but now they're all independent. So um, not only are the Nationals not doing a good job for regional people in Queensland, they're also, even as an independent group, they're not doing, do, doing too well for regional people in uh, New South Wales. Mm. Uh, we're the safest seat, I think, in Queensland for the LNP, and I think Maranoa might be federally as well but geez in the state if, if we run a candidate of 
you know, some ability. I don't think it'd be very difficult to probably flip that um, going forward, just off what we've seen so far. I can, tell, I can tell you as someone who actually talks to real people like Pauline Hanson does, Pauline Hanson is the only politician I've ever met that hasn't looked over my shoulder to see if there's a more important person coming along. Only politician that I've ever seen sit down and genuinely listen to anyone, no matter what their socioeconomic status is, mm. and listen to them. And they the only thing... They hate her because of that. The LNP, mm. sorry, the coalition preferenced her last in the last Senate election to get rid of her because they hate her honesty. Yeah, the only thing I was disappointed in Pauline with was is I assumed she'd be somewhere between seven and eight foot tall, but she's <laughs> she's only probably five and a half foot. Yeah, <laughs> but the, but that red red hair it makes up for it. Um, oh, it's insane! It's awesome. So, in, in regards to this story, uh, this this incident down in your, your area. Um, is it having a wider effect within the community in regards to uh, business confidence, uh, investment and planning futures? Because to me, it would seem uh, we're on the hook as we go mm. forward that anything could suddenly pop out and, and bite us on the backside. I think it's it's going to be more of a political dent to them. Like pretty much, I think, Hirohito or one of those... Uh, Yamamoto or someone in the Second World War, the Japanese uh, general said, you awakening a sleeping giant. Well, we've all sat back here and just copped it on the chin forever, but now there's so many people that are getting through the community going, we've had enough of this crap. Like, uh, that's going to be the biggest change because so, we're not going to sit back and cop it. We're not. We're not, not going to have our businesses, our lives, our past and our futures dictated to by bullshit, to be honest. Like, it's, it's not going to happen. I think one of the biggest things, that the messaging they're not getting is um, the difference between people in regional uh, Australia versus the people in the capital cities. Um, I mean, yes, Queensland voted, very, was the, most, uh, the strongest vote against the no, but we also had the biggest, uh, almost the biggest discrepancy in that you had uh, a seat like Ryan, I think it's a green seat, vote 55% against and but then when you went to places yeah. like Flynn, they were eighty-seven percent, you know, ag against the, the voice. Um, so, and and you've had the same thing in New South Wales. You had um, places like um, the Prime Minister's seat; they voted in favour of the voice, and places like Parks voted eighty-seven, nearly ninety percent against. So do you think this battleground between regional people and, and, this, and people in you know, places like Brisbane and the Gold Coast and Sunshine Coast, uh, is this, this gap, gap going to become wider as time uh, continues? Because the next thing we've got on our plate mm -hmm. is, is this um, uh, improved nature or something, what it is from the... Uh, nature positive. Uh, nature positive. positive. Now, don't come straight from the United Nations. Just Google, or don't Google because Google's corrupt as. Just search up Nature Positive, United Nations, straight from the United Nations. Well, well that, that seems to be the next cab off the ramp to stop just about every bit of development you can possibly have, you know, from a, from a home improvement to, you know, a, um, a building site or, or any, any sort of... Uh, Except for renewables. So I said for you, that 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 gets a, a free free pass all the time. Um, but why why are we as a sovereign nation? Why are we sort of signing up for this thing so quickly and that? And the government's not even talking talking to the people of what the implications are. Do do we need to have more referendums or something where the people can have you know put a no on a lot of this stuff that the government's forcing down our throat? We just really need to put a fence around the southeast corner of Queensland and no, literally lock no, Brisbane and them suburbs out because <laughs> no one's coming no. up with the crazy shit. We're just getting on with life out here. No, we, we, get no, we, get we get droughts, we get floods. We're not getting on with life. We're getting shafted by the globalists and the United Nations and everyone's getting shafted by them. And I, I was born on a farm. We moved to the city. I've lived 
more than half my life in the country. I've travelled the world. I can tell you that city people are good people, but you solve divide and conquer things. So they're pitting now the city and the country to, against each other. They're pitting Aboriginal, so ancestry, whatever, against everyone else. They're dividing us on sexuality, like who gives a fuck if that someone shags in their bedroom? Like, why is that in the workplace? Why is that in schools? My daughter was at a school in Brisbane where girls were sitting in their lesbian group and their bi group and their freaking trans group. What has that got to do with school? Like, this is divide and conquer by the globalists, by the United Nations, by Xi in China, who is fucking playing us like a fiddle. It's a very big picture thing. And until we say no, it's not going to stop. And the people need to actually say no, but most of them are too scared to say no because now they all self-censor. The so I was, is- I was censored to death in COVID, censored to death. As a, a very critical thinker, well, not even a critical thinker, just, I just question everything. So I researched the whole world on COVID. I kind of looked at Israel, which was a whole um, Pfizer experiment because they signed up. So because they signed up, they got the first Pfizer doses and myocarditis in young men was going up and up and up. So I've got two young teenage boys at the time. Like, my boys are not touching that shit. I got censored to death putting raw data on Facebook the whole time. And that censorship makes, and you get called an anti-vaxxer, you get called a transphobe, you get called a racist, you get called a climate change denier, and that's how they shut us all up. I think one of the things too is, uh, you know, all, all these sort of things, you've got to, got to be very articulate and, and clever in, in your in your conversation. I am. I got I got I got banned from the AMA for I don't swear on social media, okay? I'm a little excited tonight, but I do not swear <laughs> when I am on Facebook. So I got banned from the AMA for citing direct data from the Australian Government Health website. I got banned from the Australian Government um, Health Federal page for citing their own data. I've been blocked by Lydia, uh, not Lydia Thorpe, by um, Marine Faruqi for citing a very good article on her Hamas corruption. We fund that. We fund those Facebook pages. I am always polite. I'm always evidence based. You saw my submission or our submission. I, that's how I am on social media, and I get blocked. That is the censorship. Well, I think it's going to be it may be even more difficult in the future as well. Um, We've just gone over the hour. It's on the hour. Um, Michael, I'll just ask you in the in the first instance in regards to um, with the consultations you end up having, uh, did they feel like conversations or uh, consultations or are they just fait complete? And the general mood of, of the overall community and the wider community in, in the Shire, um, what do you think the conversation is going to be in regards to um, <laughs> um, having respect for their councillors and that over the next, over the coming months and year? Well, we haven't really had any consultation yet at all. The only meetings we've had is people coming out to just talk rubbish at us. Like it, no one's asked to see our opinion on anything yet. <laughs> There's been a few little sneaky, oh, what would you like here? Do you want to like do a deal over this and that bit of land and all this crap? But you can't negotiate that with random citizens in the shire. Like it's, it can't be done behind closed doors. This is, it's insanity what this is. As far as the councillors go and the mayor, I'd move town. I wouldn't <laughs> show my face in this community for what they've signed us up to. I, I, I really wouldn't. I'd be that embarrassed of myself and what I've done to my family name that I would, I'd leave. In regards to the conversation, like your your um what, 30 or 50 to 50 kilometres uh, west of uh, Gundawundi. Um, how, how are people in the further away from you, are, are they getting involved or, or commenting on the situation or is it, is it just uh, uh, locked around to your general community or has oh, it, no, it got no, to the water? As, as we're getting the information out, yeah, it's getting pretty good. Uh, 
my mate, um, brother-in-law, Robbie Henner and me just kicking down the main street there yesterday. And you know, at some points there, we felt like we might've been minor celebrities. Like everybody was very uh, <laughs> excited about what we put out. So I'm sure Anna's experienced the same thing because oh, it, with, without us uh, and not, it's not just us. We're just using my name, essentially that the whole community, most of the community is behind me, but it's not just people from our, like to the area, it's gun to windy. It's people from all over the place. A lady come from Mackay to come to one of these meetings. It's crazy what they, they they're trying to isolate it down as it's just two beer. Let's go and talk. They wanted us to get a few people to a meeting, like five people, and they'd send ten there and tell us how it's going to be. Well, we turned up with 150. It wasn't even a challenge. We didn't even have to try that hard to do that. Like nobody's going to cop this shit. I think you missed your opportunity because this happened, this started off a couple of months ago. You should have went and registered for um, council elections. You probably would have would have shooted him. Uh, you don't want to be self-serving <laughs> in something like this because I knew I was going to have to follow this through to the end. So you'd hate to uh, appear that you were trying to better yourself in the process. Yeah. And I, I'd be a, be a little bit too busy to be a town councillor, to be honest with you, with um, what, what we sort of got going on. You couldn't probably be that shonky anyway. <laughs> no, if I had to cop that in one meeting, I'd be in prison. If it was, that's how it was. If you couldn't say something, well, I'm going to say it. I don't to care. be honest, can I butt in here because I, in defence of the councillors, I, I don't think I don't think councillors. I think they got themselves into a sticky situation. I know them all, uh, except one, quite well. Um, I think they're all decent people. I just think that. All this stuff is so complicated and it's so nefarious that they've been sucked into this and now they just don't know what to do and then they've been gagged. Well, that's uh, unfortunate, but we do hope that things pan out for the better. Um, but it, it's, like you say, it's not just your area. Uh, we've just had a, a major claim on the township of Laura up here. Uh, it was it was the area was already under native title, but then another group's come in for uh, a claim for exclusive rights of a, a number of areas. So it's it's going to continue to be a problem that we're going to have, and maybe I, I expect Western Australia and Queensland to bear the brunt of it uh, because the <laughs> New South Wales and uh, Victoria are pretty well. Um, Protected by the fact that they're huge, huge population and that, but we oh, seem to be. No, but we'll, New, South we'll be New South Wales has this math. Their native title is not settled. Mm. Whereas Queensland and um, Western Australia, the native title, a lot of it is pretty much settled. Whereas New South Wales, look at the map, it has this massive blue area, which is un unsettled native title. So they've got, a, they've got a massive shit show coming up, which the lawyers will make a fortune from and no one else will win. So this, this whole thing needs to be simplified and sorted out very soon or Australia is going to be an even bigger basket case than it already is. It's like the inland rail is stuck at North Star because they don't want to negotiate with United Title holders, which is because they have all the forestry now, and that's where the inland rail should go. But no, they don't want to deal with all that. Shit. So they're trying to go through farms, and the farmers don't want them to go through there. So now they're stuck at North Star. They've spent $2 billion bucks of our money because they don't actually forward plan. Like it's like us building a cotton farm with no dam and no water license and then going, oh, oh, we've got a farm, give us a dam, give us a water license right now. That's how they're doing it. I suppose the thing is they think it's easy to bulldoze uh, people you know, on freehold land, just ordinary ordinary farmers and that, than it is to deal with the native title. So that, that's a bit of scary. It's not because they've hit two farmers who are very stubborn. <laughs> and they don't care about the government. So now they've got native title and two very southern farmers. Well, we've spent two million bucks on a railroad that's going nowhere soon. Okay, then. Um, Here's my language. I'm sorry. My mother texted me and said to stop swearing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. Uh, if you just like the, um, I'll let you go first, Anna. Um, just. Um, Give us your final final impressions of what's going to happen and what needs to be done, or we just have to grin and bear it. Um, 
We need to stop voting for the majors. We need to get behind other parties because the majors, as I said before, are beholden to the unions, the globalists. Uh, G is in there being evil. And until people actually see that, and I'm trying my hardest, if you look at my Facebook feed and a power just gone public, you will see that I'm very keen for things to change because if we don't change now, we are in very, very big trouble. We have 75% of kids have been indoctrinated in the education system saying that socialism is better than democracy. That's our future. That's the future kids coming through. That's what they believe because they wrote, rewrite history. They've been told that this is a racist country, that where the evil colonists stole the land from the engineers and farmers, not the hunters and gatherers. They've just totally eradicated that from history books. So these kids have learned a totally false history. They're dividing us to conquer us. So we all bicker, bicker between each other while they're sneakily putting these fucking solar park farms. This company from Singapore, not from Singapore, based in Singapore, this is their first solar farm. They have plans for the whole of the Darling Downs. Why are they spending millions of dollars on one weird road in the middle of nowhere putting bitumen in it if they only want one little solar farm? They don't do that. Okay, then. Well, over to you, Mike. And there's another show for you. And I have a very sad <laughs> Well, yeah, I'll come back to that. I've got to speak to you off, offline a little bit later. <laughs> okay, Michael, um, what do you hope happens for your community and what, what do you hope uh, that the council sort of uh, starts doing or having a, uh, a bit more thought process in regards to what they're doing, uh, seeing that they're, they're still partly in, in their court? Uh, yeah, as powerful as they sound in this situation, I think really we need to get the whole of Queensland behind this and let's stop this in two beer. Let's literally pull this whole shit show up in two beer. This is your citadel of this this war. Get your weird stuff, take it back to Brisbane, and keep all your weird, <laughs> strange ideas in Brisbane and leave us alone. That's essentially how it'll go. So we need to uh, pressure the Queensland LNP into standing up for us because they did say they don't support treaty. So show us that. Come and show us how you don't support treaty by... Maybe just write a letter just asking for due process and community consultation. Uh, well, that'd be a great start. We're not asking them to do anything too crazy. So yeah, I think going forward, that would be the way to go. Obviously, like, geez, if our councillors and mayor don't regret having uh, signed us away in the fashion they did by now, then I don't know if there's any help for them. But hopefully uh, everyone in the Shire will, will be able to uh, help uh, them understand that a bit better. I think we've got 10,000 people or so in the in the shire here, which will make their voice clearly heard. Okay, then. Thanks very much. Uh, if you just stay on the line for a second, I'll just um, do an out, outro and uh, introduce next week's show. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Michael and Anna, for your time tonight. Really appreciate your time. Uh, if you enjoyed the show, please like, share and subscribe to our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Our show next week will be with Professor uh, Jonathan Knott, and we'll be talking about what we can do to mitigate the effects of the re with, that we've seen from the indonation in from uh, Cyclone Jasper and its effect on regional Queensland, and especially around the Cairns to Point and Cooktown area and far down to Zingham. So we'll, we'll be discussing uh, mitigation for floodplains and what we should be doing in the future out of this rebuild that's required from uh, fixing the damage that we've had. So please join us again next week. Thank you.